Live from the Lusack Library in Anchorage, here is KTVA 11 News anchor Joe Vigil. All right, good evening everyone. I'm Joe Vigil with KTVA 11. We want to welcome you to our town hall meeting tonight on opioids addicted in Alaska. So first of all, we want to thank uh, the Lusack Library for letting us be in the Will the Marston Theater tonight. Uh, thank you to all of you who showed up. Panelists, thank you for coming, all of you, and of course, those of you watching tonight on TV. So I guess the question really is tonight, I mean, why are we here? Why are we here tonight? I think the answer to that is that opioids are killing people in Alaska. Uh, they're devastating families, and I hope by the end of the evening that we can work on some solutions. You know, where are we going with this? Uh, we're going to hear from people impacted by this. We're going to hear from people uh, who have lost loved ones to this horrible, horrible epidemic. And we're going to hear from leaders tonight, um, people here who have the power to make change. So we're going to get right into our discussion. First of all, I want to let you know that we're taking uh, questions tonight uh, here. If you're watching on TV as well, you can ask questions on Facebook. You can also send your questions to AK Voices, hashtag AK Voices, or hashtag Addicted to Addicted Alaska. So you can send those in. We'll try to get those questions on for you. Uh, right now, we want to introduce the panel. If we could, I'm going to step back. Uh, first of all, Governor Bill Walker tonight. Governor, thanks for being here. You bet. Anchorage Mayor Ethan Berkowitz is here this evening. Senator John Coghill representing the Fairbanks North Star Borough. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jay Butler right over here, Alaska's Chief Medical Officer with the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services. Dr. Ann Zink, right next to him, Medical Director of the Matsu Regional Medical Center and an emergency room doctor. We have Anchorage Police Chief Justin Dahl on the end. Chief, thanks for coming. Lisa Souter, the Executive Director of Beans Cafe, to my left, and uh, Amy uh, Erbach, a recovering opioid addict who's clean and sober. Thank you for coming, we appreciate that. I don't mean to put you on the spot, Amy, but you know, th this is really about you, about where you've been and where you are today. Um, again, we're gonna talk to people I, who have lost loved ones and, and, as, and you know personally that situation. So thank you very much for being here. We You're appreciate welcome. that. Um, okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start by asking uh, each of our panelists to basically talk about their connection with opioids uh, personally and professionally. Governor, we're gonna start with you. So in February, you declared opioid uh, abuse a public health disaster. What led you to that decision? <clears throat> well, it was clear it is a disaster and it was appropriate. You know, we, we do declarations of disaster for lots of different things in Alaska. And I felt that in order for us to, to elevate this issue to the, uh, the crisis that it is, I should uh, issue a declaration of disaster. I did that uh, in February of this year a declaration of disaster from the governor is only good for 30 days. I asked the legislature to pass legislation to allow that to stay in for a year. And the legislature, to their credit, they took that a year and said, Look, we'll make it two years. So it's a, it's a disaster declaration that stays in effect for two years. I, I appreciate that very much. All right, Governor, thanks. Mayor Berkowitz, uh, from the perspective of the mayor of the state's uh, largest city, what are the impacts that we're seeing here in Anchorage? You know, I think anybody who lives in Anchorage sees the impacts on a daily basis. It affects our neighborhoods, it affects our friends, it affects people we know. So there's an intimacy to the impact of heroin and other opioids on us. As mayor, I see the impact that it has on our fire department because of the calls for service that the, those uh, folks have to make on a regular basis, what the police department has to do. I see uh, overstressed social services. And in, in, in short, we see the, the necessity of the state being able to partner with the federal government, with the, with the state government, and with the nonprofits in our community so we can provide adequate protection for our people from the importation of drugs as well as the proper safety net so that if people are caught up in a drug world, they have the ability to recover. Mayor, thank you. Dr. Butler, what makes this an epidemic and, and how have we gotten to this point where we are right now? Well, when I came into this job in December of 2014, I wanted to get a good feel of what is the health status of Alaska and not just what is making people sick and what is killing them, but what are the trends? And one of the things that really jumped out at me was the fact that the number of people dying of opioid overdose had quadrupled over a period of a little over a decade. And 
So that is, in my mind, what defines it as an epidemic. It's not just the fact that it's a big deal, but it's a deal that is getting worse every year and one where we need to intervene. Uh, what brought us to it, that is a much longer story than uh, 45 seconds, but I will say that it started with how we managed pain. And so uh, as coming into this in the, with the background of an infectious disease physician where I uh, sort of saw drugs as both beneficial and life-saving and potentially uh, causing problems, as we know antibiotics can cause drug-resistant infections, I got very interested in how we're managing pain could be a driver for uh, basically a, 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 a epidemiologic phenomenon of, of ill health. Doctor, we'll talk about that a little more actually in depth. Uh, Senator Coghill, the legislature in June passed a bill that gives medical boards and Alaskans the ability to limit the use of prescriptions, uh, opioids. It has uh, bipartisan support. Why do lawmakers feel this was a necessary step? And can you tell us what you are hearing about opioids uh, in Fairbanks? Sure, the, uh, the bill was passed uh, in response to uh, what's going on in our society. The overprescription, uh, uh, certainly there's times where it's needed, but we, what would look to us like an overprescription. So it, this gives an accountability uh, a limitation that you have to be able to explain why you go over that limitation. I think that's appropriate. Uh, the question is, how do we communicate? So this set up a better way of communicating, which we struggle with. I mean, to be fair, it's, it's gonna be a work in progress. Uh, and then uh, the pr privately, I've seen it in my own family. Uh, so personally, uh, publicly, I've seen it not only in this particular issue, but in our workforce development, in our criminal justice issues. So uh, how do we get resources to where they need to be uh, in order to divert people if, it, if they can be diverted? Uh, and one of the ways is the supply, and that was the prescription drug issue. Uh, and then the illegal supplies, we gotta deal with that too. So I mean, it's, it's a whole range of issues. Okay, Senator, thanks. Dr. Zink, what do you see out in the Valley as far as opioids? Yeah, no, thanks for having us here. I feel like we're at that crossroads between both of these things. We're both prescribing opiates and we're seeing a loved one come in with their daughter who has recently died of a heroin overdose and having to tell them that we're sorry, there was nothing else that we can do. And we're seeing heroin addicts coming in begging for help and begging for another step and another chance and not having any way uh, to give them services. So I feel like we're stuck between those two worlds and we've been lied to by the prescription drug company for a long time saying these were safe and we want nothing more than to help the people that we're seeing face to face and when they're telling us that they're in miserable pain you want to help people with the pain that's why we got into medicine but we're also causing a problem. And so we've really been trying to figure out how to figure out that balance and we see it on both sides. Do you know the last time out there uh, that someone died from opioids? You know, I would say it's almost every shift that I get every called shift. on. Not just e every day, every shift. On either someone who's overdosed or someone who has been uh, resuscitated or someone who's struggling with addiction. Doctor, thanks. Uh, Chief uh, Dahl, can you tell us how often your officers are impacted uh, by opioids as they encounter people out uh, in the city? Oh, certainly. I think that's something that uh, officers at the Anchorage Police Department deal with on a daily basis. I mean, it's not just, uh, you know, I think a lot of uh, what you think about with the police department is that we're dealing with the criminal impact of opioid addiction, which is people who are constantly trying to feed that addiction through criminal activity. But our officers are dealing with people face to face who are suffering through addiction on a daily basis. <sighs> and trying to find ways to help them. And typically there's not a lot that they can do as far as that goes. There are not a lot of avenues to, for them to follow up on. All right, Chief, thanks. Lisa Souter, you have a personal and professional perspective on this. First of all, you work at Beans Cafe. Uh, the, the clientele, some of them obviously have some addiction problems, but you also have a personal story to tell. Would you mind sharing that? Absolutely, you know, we certainly um, work with folks every day who are struggling with mental health issues and uh, alcohol and drug issues. Um, it's something we see uh, obviously throughout Alaska and throughout the country. Um, I'm proud to be able to try and help people as much as possible on a daily basis with that. Um, in my own life, this has impacted me greatly. I lost my oldest son on December 3rd to a heroin overdose. And I really want to have everyone understand that it can happen to anyone. It can happen to any family. It can happen to any child. That's why we're here. Absolutely. Hopefully we can find some solutions. Uh, thank you for that story. That brings us to Amy Erbach, and uh, you're on the panel here. 
Um, no disrespect to the panel, but you're here because you're not an official. <laughs> um, I want to ask you, um, when we first met uh, on the Park Strip, we were talking and, and, and I asked you, you know, what, what kind of pills are you addicted to? And you told me I'm a more addict. What is a more addict? I was addicted to anything that would make me not feel. Whatever you could get. Whatever I could get. I want to ask you, on, on New Year's Eve, of course, that's a time for celebration. We all go, I like to be out uh, and be festive. Uh, what were you planning to do on New Year's in 2013? I had planned to commit suicide. Why? Because I didn't believe that I was going to get into treatment, and that was my only solution at that moment. So. That was my answer. But you got into treatment. I did, that day. And you're here now I with am. us. <laughs> Go ahead and applaud, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, okay. She said she loved you if you didn't hear that. I uh, want to set the stage now for uh, our conversation. So according to the governor's emergency disaster declaration in February, between 2009 and 2015, the number of heroin-associated deaths quadrupled in Alaska. Our death rate from opioid overdoses exceeds the national average. Last year, 128 Alaskans died from drug overdoses, nearly 75% from opioids, 38% of those deaths were from heroin. It's a national epidemic, folks. It has claimed 200,000 lives in 20 years. And of course, Alaska has not gone untouched. 774 dads, mothers, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles. That's how many people died from a drug overdose in Alaska from 2009 to 2015. The unfolding tragedy of Alaska's heroin epidemic is ruining the lives of too many Alaskans. The drug problem so bad in Alaska that in 2016, Governor Bill Walker declared a disaster. Then this summer, he signed House Bill 159 into law, which limits the number of opioids a doctor can prescribe and requires education on addiction for prescribers. How many of those who've died OD'd on prescription pain pills. Many who ended up addicted to those pills gravitated to the cheaper and the more accessible heroin. Both killing Alaskans at twice the rate as anywhere else in the nation. John Green's daughter Kelsey died in a jail cell in 2016 as she fought to get clean from addiction. She's not a low-life scum. She's my daughter. Another sign of the magnitude of the epidemic, an overwhelmed Anchorage needle exchange. The Alaska AIDS Assistance Association in Anchorage distributed more than 600,000 syringes in the last fiscal year and took in more than 700,000. Needles used by dads, mothers, brothers, and sisters. Almost as many needles as there are people in Alaska. Big number, yeah. big number, guys. Um, so if that doesn't show the magnitude of the problem, maybe uh, some new figures, well, that we got a hold of. So according to a University of Arkansas study, you have a one in five chance of becoming a long-term user of prescription pain pills with a 10-day supply, just 10 days. However, your chances of becoming addicted to opioids, 50-50 if you're on painkillers for more than 30 days. You're shaking your head. You can believe that, can you? Um, Amy, I guess I want to ask you, how did you get your pills? Um, well, it's relatively easy to find them on the street, but most times um, I would go to the hospital and tell them that I was in pain in the emergency room, and they would write me a prescription. Even in recovery, I've found that um, when I walk into the hospital and tell them that I'm in recovery, um, I'm usually offered pain medication once or twice before I leave. They're asking you if you want pain medication when you've already told them you, you don't. Yeah, that's the addict. first thing that I say when I walk into the hospital is that I'm an addict in recovery. Please don't offer me pain medication. And you also talked to me about uh, a former relationship and how you got pills. Can you explain that to everyone as well? You talked to me on the phone about uh, how you were able to get large supplies when people weren't even on the phone. Oh, um, yeah, I, someone that I was close to had an on-the-job injury and um, 
he went to a doctor for workman's comp and um, they prescribed him a large amount of um, one type of pain medication and he called them back a couple days later and said it wasn't working. So they um, prescribed him a different kind and a large amount and then he called back a couple days later and said the same thing and on they the just all over the phone. Didn't have to go to the no. drugstore, didn't need a piece of paper. No. He would call in the prescription to the pharmacy and we would go pick it up. How many how many pills would they give you at a time? Do you remember? I, I they were pretty big bottles. I would say at least 60 if not more.